Hey, give the worship team a hand. That was awesome, huh? One of those weeks, it's just like, all right, we're good. Let's, let's just go home. Let's go to dinner, call it a day. So much nourishment in those words and those songs and just lifting our voices and praise to God. We are in week number two of a two-week series called Losing My Religion. My name is Brian Culbertson. I am one of the pastors here. If you missed last week, I encourage you. It's a two-part series, so go back and catch part one. You can do that on YouTube or uh, your favorite podcasting app. Just search refuge.church Fort Myers, and it'll pull that right up. Last week, we explored how many of the darkest chapters in human history were either shaped by or caused by or made worse by religion. We also explored how for many of us, the darkest chapters in our lives were also caused by or intensified by religion. And so if you find yourself in this room tonight struggling or having struggled with religion, know this, so did Jesus. Through his life, Jesus pushed back against religion. And religion doesn't take being called out so well. And so religion, not taking kindly to being questioned, responded by silencing its threat. Jesus, three days later, emerges from the grave not to start a new religion, but to replace religion with himself. Religion exploits our human nature, and so it makes us like to justify the junk that we have in our own lives and then elevate the junk that everybody else has in their lives. Religion likes us to judge others. It wants us to reduce our thinking to black and white. Religion causes us to reduce or to resist change, to fear the unknown, and to manipulate for power. But in Scripture, there is a positive definition of the word religion, and we find that in the book of James. His wisdom in chapter 1 says, Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress. We're a keep it simple, stupid type church. And so biblical religion so easily defined as this, caring for the oppressed. It's that easy. Susan Cottrell, she writes this, and we looked at it last week. She said, before religion made it all about what we believe, Jesus was all about how we love. And so losing my religion, stepping into Jesus means stepping away from judgment, stepping towards grace, moving away from exclusion and embracing inclusion, leaving behind the rituals to care for the oppressed, shifting our focus from the afterlife rewards to committing to the urgent needs and work of healing that needs to be done in the right here and the right now. And so for our second and final week of this series, I had a tough time picking which story about Jesus confronting religion, because there are so many, and they are all golden. But with Easter being next weekend, I wanted to help guide us tonight in that direction. And so instead of picking just one story, I had to pick two, so you get a BOGO sermon tonight. Buy one, get one uh, at Refuge. Two stories, one sermon. They both come from John's gospel, and they both take place in a very sacred place called the temple the central point for all religion in this time. And so we start in the Gospel of John, chapter 8. If your Bible, if you go to it, sometimes it has the little headings at the top. That's not actually there in the original manuscript. People came back later and added that. The heading for this chapter simply says, A Woman Caught in Adultery. I think that's a bad title. It could be better. It could be uh, Confronting Religious Hypocrisy because that's what the story's about, or it could be a love and lesson in humility. It'd be a better title. But we're going to call it Woman Caught in Adultery. Uh, chapter 8, verse 1, it begins like this. It says, Jesus returned from the Mount of Olives. Jesus has been at the Mount of Olives, a quiet place. He's out in nature, spent the night under the stars. He's been praying. He's been reflecting. He's been doing that solitude and silence that we talk about here so much. It says, but early the next morning, he was back again, it means he goes there a lot, he was back again at the temple. And so as the sun rises, Jesus heads over to the temple. The temple is the place where people came to worship, to listen to teaching, to dialogue, to be a part of religious community, very much like what we're doing tonight in this room. And it says, a crowd soon gathered, and he sat down, and he taught them. 
Jesus isn't elevated on a stage. In fact, he's not even standing up. He's sitting, which I think is a great way to teach. I need to get a chair up here and begin that. Jesus is right there. He's in the midst of the people. He's in the midst of everyday life, and he's simply relaying stories about God, stories of farming and fishing and baking bread to illustrate God and his kingdom. And so Jesus is there, and he's teaching. In verse 3, it says, as he was speaking, the other teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, more religious people, brought a woman who had been caught in the act, awkward, of adultery. They catch her, it says. And it says they put her in front of the crowd. Religion loves to make a public spectacle of the sins, not of yourself, but the sins of those people, others. We haven't changed a lot with that today. I see a lot of social media shaming, of being caught in the act. Somebody shares a doubt or a struggle or an opinion, and they're caught in the act. And instead of being received by other Christians with empathy, it's received with judgmental comments or their salvation is questioned. Or how about gossip? It kind of thrives on catching someone in the act, something in their past maybe, and then broadcasting that moment to anyone who will listen. It's public shaming. I don't know if you've ever heard of these pulpit call-outs. <laughs> Pastor's up preaching, starts talking about a sin. It's like the sin of one person in the room, and everybody knows who that person is. It's public shaming. Or public prayer requests, you know, where everybody knows the prayer request that's being made and who it's about and roundabout way of gossiping. Or I've heard of these, and this is really disgusting. Church counseling sessions, you know, look to be used for good, Then they're used as ammunition to publicly shame that person who shared their innermost feelings and emotions. Or how about those scapegoat sermons where the pastor gets up and he blames every issue in society on those sinful people over there, public shaming. Or those religious rallies where they're holding up the signs and tacking an entire people group that were caught in the act of some heinous sin. Verse 5, it says, teacher, this is the religious people speaking, they say to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery, and the law of Moses, the Bible, says to stone her. It's a true story. That's what the Bible says more than once. And so we can say, the Bible clearly states, and go to Leviticus 20, if a man commits adultery, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall be put to death. It's found more than once in Scripture. And so I don't know what the modern religious people who say the Bible must be taken literally in everything do about this law or why this isn't on our next political ballot. It sounds like something we ought to deal with as a country. Verse 6 says, what do you say? All right, Jesus, this is the law of Moses, the great Moses. What do you say, Jesus? They're trying to trip him up here says they were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. Okay, this isn't about this woman. It isn't even about sin. Right here, what we got going on is some religious agenda. They're simply seeking ammunition to use against Jesus. Here we have these religious leaders, and they have a man that's been going around saying all kinds of things, saying that it's okay to question the religious authority, saying it's okay to question doctrine and interpretation, to put loving people and showing mercy as the higher law, and we need to stop this guy. And so they come at him, and so how's Jesus going to respond? Disciples, I know they got to be sitting over here. They're like, all right, Jesus, here you go, man. You got to give it to them. So here's how Jesus responds. It says, he stooped down. And wrote in the dust with his finger. It's one of the oddest moments in all of the Gospels. Jesus responds to these very important people playing in the dirt like a little kid. And we're not told what he writes. And I think that's on purpose. I think if the words were important, we would have been told. We're just told that he's writing in the dirt, right down there in the dust. Maybe he's writing out the word justice or mercy I like to think he's writing the word sin and then erases it and then writes it and then erases it over and over again. This is from the first book of opinions, 
by Brian Culbertson. <laughs> Jesus is fully God, and he's fully human. And so what I think is happening here is Jesus is trying to avoid a knee-jerk reaction. That's the human nature in him. He, he wants to attack. He wants, he's smarter than they are. And so he takes time to pause, to consider his words, to consider his tone. He thinks about how the words I'm about to say is going to affect that woman. How the words I'm going to say is going to affect this crowd that is gathered around me. He's even thinking how the words that I'm saying are going to affect the people at Refuge Church in 2024. I'm not sure what the words he was writing. He's just doodling and he's thinking. Verse 7, the, the religious people don't like it. It says they kept demanding an answer. That's religion, black and white thinking. Use God's law for power and manipulation. So finally it says he stood up again. He said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down and again wrote in the dust. Jesus stands. He's very precise with his words. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Mic drop. Back to playing in the dirt. <laughs> Instead of getting into a word battle with these people, he disarms the religious by holding up a mirror to their hypocrisy. We had a beautiful wedding in this church last night. Congratulations to Annika and Nicole. Everybody can give them a round of applause. The wedding was supposed to be held in my backyard. We offered it up to them. We have a beautiful backyard on two acres. You all know what the weather was like yesterday, right? It was nasty. So last minute, they had to punt, scramble, and they set it up in this church and, again, did a beautiful job. It was the very first wedding for a church member we ever had in this space. So it was kind of cool. I don't know why we've never done that, but it was a, it's a beautiful venue if anybody's thinking about ever getting menu. It worked out, worked out quite well, except for the cleanup the next day. But knowing that the wedding was supposed to be at my house, uh, I needed to get cleaned up. So last Sunday, we stayed home, and we were getting the house ready, and, and I needed to power wash. Everything was getting kind of dirty and moldy. And, I, you know, I'm like, it's not that dirty. And if you've ever power washed that first streak, you're like, oh, boy, that was really gross and dirty. And so you're cleaning, and you're going swipe by swipe, and you're cleaning off the obvious mold and the dirt. And then you get to that stuff that's just more sinister, those stubborn stains that you're like, <clears throat> and it, it just, it won't come up out of the ground no matter how much scrubbing, no matter how much, and I got a little electric power washer, so it doesn't have a lot of power anyway. And so you clean and you clean and it's just like, man, I didn't know that was dirty. And now I see this and now I see this. And the more you clean, the more dirt you see. Jesus is giving this woman's accusers time to do a little power washing. This lady She's dirty, but I'm pretty clean. And Jesus says, let he who is spotless, let he who is perfect, y'all go ahead and cast that first stone. And I'm thinking, oh, well, I mean, I mean I'm not perfect. I've sinned. I guess I'm being kind of arrogant right now with this woman. And I, I let my buddy go who was also caught in the act with her. I probably shouldn't have done that. And I think I'm probably just using this woman like he did. And as Jesus doodles in the dirt, these accusers, they begin the process. It's just amazing. There is no back and forth argument going on here. Jesus isn't trying to embarrass them. In fact, he's giving them an opportunity to avoid humiliation, which is a stark contrast to their intent. And the story says one by one, they confront the reality of their own sin. And we know this because it says in verse 9, when the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus, the one who was truly without sin, was left in the middle of the crowd with this woman. And as I read that story this week, I'll tell you what, I give these guys a lot of credit. I really do, because that, that's humiliating and that's humbling to, to come there and to admit yeah, I'm a sinner. I was wrong. To come there and choose self-reflection over further arguments and accusation, that is not easy. We know this. We've been on Facebook. <laughs> and especially when you're in a religious circle where you're supposed to hide your wrongdoings and cloak yourself in fake holiness. And so I give these guys a lot of credit. I really do. The elders, it says, 
lead this silent exodus? Why is it the elders who go first? Well, maybe they're wise because they're older, but maybe it's because they got more life behind them and they got more sins for which they should have been stoned if they were honest. And so it's oldest to the youngest. And it says they lay down their stones and they walk away. And they walk away better people for having this encounter with Jesus. They walk away, I hope, with a bit of personal growth. They walk away implicitly affirming the dignity now and the worth of this woman. Refuge is a safe place for all people to explore and restore their faith in Jesus and his church. We say that because there are a lot of people in this room with a lot of religious trauma a lot of religious stones that have been thrown in your direction. A lot of your life, you've spent ducking and dodging of those stones have been thrown. You've been caught in the act of questioning some religious interpretation and having those stones thrown at you for your lack of faith or leading others astray. You've been caught loving someone of the same sex and having stones thrown and resulted in being expelled from your Christian school been caught in the act. We've been called out for spiritual manipulation and having stones thrown for rebellion and causing division. Been caught challenging the purity culture. My wife did that, and she had stones thrown for promoting immorality. Caught opening up your church to the wrong kind of people and have those stones thrown saying you're putting grace above truth. Or maybe you have been caught in sin. You've been caught in a lie. And instead of being shown mercy, you're just now labeled as someone who can never be trusted again. Or maybe, maybe you've caught yourself. You've caught yourself neglecting the needs of the poor. And you just started dumping stones on yourself, putting them over your head, dropping them, saying, you loser, you fake, you religious hypocrite. Verse 10 says, then Jesus stood up again. And he said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? She replies, no, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Aha. That's the Jesus religion likes. <laughs> Go and sin no more. Love the sinner, hate the sin, and other such religious silly arguments. When Jesus says, go and sin no more, he's not giving this lady an ultimatum. He's not saying, honey, that's strike two. Next sin, you're done. Jesus is offering this lady a new beginning. This is a baptism of sorts. She is being liberated from her past, grounded in unconditional acceptance. We can never separate these two statements. I do not condemn you. Now go and sin no more. Those two phrases always have to be said together because that is the gospel. The gospel is, I do not condemn you. That's what God says. We are boundless in the grace of God, the assurance that despite our flaws, we are not condemned. Go and sin no more. It's the invitation to step into new life. I do not condemn you. Go and sin no more. The order of those two things is paramount. The grace precedes the transformation. And it's the very grace that then empowers and motivates us to go and pursue that better life. Not out of fear, but out of love for the one who first loved us. Is this woman's adultery a sin? Yeah. For by the letter of the law, she committed a sin. But we don't know the situation. We don't know where this guy is that got her into this. We don't know what led to this moment. We don't know what kind of parents she had. Maybe they taught her her only worth was her body and what that body could get for her. I reached out to a friend of mine who preached this a long time ago. And when I was first a Christian, I was looking for preachers to listen to that I could learn from. And he became a friend of mine over the years. He has a church over on the other coast. And I'm like, man, I remember you preaching a sermon on this. And you said something really good about this go and sin no more. And he's like, I don't really remember that sermon's been a long time ago. But I'll just share with you what he texted me back. He says, I don't think Jesus was saying sin in the general sense. More that he means stop making your life harder and heavier by, being, by getting caught up in all this adultery stuff. You're hurting yourself, and I hate that because I love you. Get on a soapbox for a minute here. It's funny. I think about this a lot. 
I could stand up here, man, and I, I could preach a judgmental and an angry God and a vengeful God, and you know what? Most Christians wouldn't mind. Now, they might squirm a little bit if I went too hard in one area, but so long as I picked their favorite sin, they wouldn't mind so much. But man, when I start preaching a God that is too accepting and too forgiving and too merciful and reckless with his love, here come the stones. Trust me, I got them. Great writer Shane Claiborne Uh, He's of our generation, my same age. He says this. He says, those who follow Jesus should attract the same people Jesus attracted and frustrate the same people Jesus frustrated. Who did Jesus attract? Those marginalized by society, the poor, the outcast, the notorious sinner. Who did Jesus frustrate? Time and time again, it's the religious, the self-righteous, the pious. So that brings us to your BOGO story, story number two of the night. It's in John chapter two. So we just came from John chapter eight. We're going backwards to John chapter two. One thing you need to know about the gospel of John, it's not written in chronological order. He was writing to explain theology, and so he put things in thematic order. So the order of the gospel of John isn't necessarily the order in which things happened. And so this event that we're about to look at, if we go over to the synoptic gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this incident occurs during Holy Week, this week we're about to come into right now, starting tomorrow with Palm Sunday. You know, Palm Sunday is a triumphant entry. Jesus comes in on a burrito, on a donkey. (laughs) I wonder who would get that. And this this story occurs. So Jesus comes in, it's a triumphant entry. And the story we're about to read occurs the next day. It's just a few days before the crucifixion. So let me put that perspective in before we get into this. So John chapter 2, verse 13. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration, so Jesus went to Jerusalem. Verse 14, in the temple, this is the same temple we were just at where Jesus showed mercy to this adulterous woman. It says, in the temple, he saw merchants selling cattle, sheep, and doves for sacrifices. He also saw dealers at tables exchanging foreign money. So it's courtyard of the temple. And again, We're at this religious epicenter. It's a place for teaching, a place for worship, a place for community, a place for prayer. And what Jesus finds there are animals intended for sacrifice, merchants selling those animals to people in need, particularly those poor people who couldn't afford their own, and money changers that are taking Greek and Roman currency and exchanging it for Jewish money to be used in the temple to buy these items. I'm sure they weren't giving them great rates. So Jesus showed mercy in the last story. Here's this story, verse 15. Jesus made a whip with some ropes and chased all of it out of the temple. He drove out the sheep and the cattle. He scattered the money changers' coins all over the floor, and he turned over their tables. Verse 16 says, Then going over to the people who sold the doves, he told them, Get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. It's a jarring image. Jesus is fired up. I dare say he is violent at this point, flipping over tables, physically casting away these people. Why is Jesus so angry? Well, I'll tell you what it's not. He's not angry because there's an adulterer there. He's not angry about drunkenness. He's not angry because there's a tax collector. He's not angry at some political candidate. He's not angry at the internet. He's not angry at the leper or the Samaritan or the man dressed in women's clothes nor the people outside the temple, not Hollywood, not Silicon Valley, not some rich young ruler, not the woman at the well, not the fisherman who lacked faith during the storm. He didn't get angry at the soldiers even who sold his clothes and gambled for them. He didn't get angry at the thief on the cross beside him. He didn't get angry at Thomas who doubted him when he returned. Why is Jesus so angry? Who is he angry with? The religious. Religion. Religion abusing what is God's. Religion preaching virtue instead of practicing vice. Religion taking advantage of the poor. Religion exploiting the faithful. Religion using God's name for financial gain. 
Anger is very out of character for Jesus. You know, Jesus did practice what he preached. And he preached things like turn the other cheeks, love your enemy. He praised those who were poor in spirit, the peacemakers, the merciful, the meek. Jesus taught patience and gentleness, not anger and violence. If Jesus is this angry, then we better pay attention. Verse 17, it says, Then his disciples remembered this prophecy from the Scriptures. Passion for God's house will consume me. And that quote comes from Isaiah 56, 7. I'll just read it. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. And so here we have religion once again doing what religion does, taking the gifts of God, twisting and bending them into methods of control, manipulation, and exclusion. I saved this post a long time ago off of Facebook. I don't know why it came up in my news feed. Got some friend that must subscribe to it. It popped up. Uh, it says WFL atheism, which I thought was um, West Florida atheism. Um, no, it's we effing love atheism is what it stands for once I went to their website. Here's what it says, though. Religion is a multi-billion dollar industry, and those benefiting from it financially will do everything in their power to keep the con going. Jesus agrees with this atheist. That's why he's angry. That's why we should be angry. That's why he takes aggressive action. That's why we should take action as well. Now, this story in particular gets a lot of run. Some Christian bully on social media is talking about some divisive political issue. He's using all kinds of hate-filled language. And it goes something like this. Well, I'm sorry if this comment about blank isn't so nice. Jesus wasn't exactly nice when he kicked people out of the temple or flipped over tables either. I'm just exhibiting some righteous anger. Heard that one? Are you, buddy? <laughs> this isn't Jesus getting defensive. This isn't Jesus trying to look smart. This isn't Jesus with hurt feelings. Jesus was constantly criticized and attacked. He never pulled out the whips. He never flipped over tables. This is a special kind of holy anger directed at religion. And I might add, he could have shown this anger at any point in the temple because this had been going on for a while. But Jesus is in such control of this anger that he reserves it for this exact moment a moment where he needs to poke the bear to begin to hasten his death, which is forthcoming. I have a question written here. Is anger always sinful? It's not. In fact, anger can be beneficial. I went back through Scripture and kind of skimmed through the Gospels. I counted 10 to 15 times we could say that Jesus shows some anger. Not in the nasty kind of way that holds up signs and yells at scared young women. Not the ugly kind of anger that causes church splits and divorces and polarization. No, Jesus' anger is beautiful and loving. It's the kind of anger that ushers in healing. Go back to the book of James again. James 1 talks about anger. It says, understand this, my brothers and sisters. You must be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. James don't say, don't ever get angry. He just says, be slow to get angry. So we're talking about godly anger, and I think a better term for it might be holy discontentment. Jonathan Edwards said that the human nature is very lazy unless it's moved by some holy emotions, such as anger. So holy anger, when we feel it, can help move us to feed the orphans and the widows when we might otherwise be lazy. We should be angry about religion. We should be angry about the infusion of politics with our spiritual beliefs. We should be angry about consumer-driven approach to worship. We should be angry about the lack of transparency and accountability in churches. We should be angry about those church signs that say all are welcome, you get inside and they say, just joking, but we'll take your money. <laughs> we should be angry that we failed to use our time and our money and our voices for pure and genuine religion of feeding the orphans and the widows. 
You know, in the Gospels, when I went back through them and looked at all the times that Jesus was angry, I picked up another thing. When Jesus was angry, it seemed he was the only person in the entire room or anybody around him that seemed to be bothered by the situation. Only Jesus confronted hypocrisy. Only Jesus was enraged at the tomb of Lazarus. Only Jesus rebuked Peter with the get behind me, Satan. No one else seemed bothered that God's church had been turned into a marketplace, except Jesus. Now, we're not Jesus, not even in the ballpark, not even in the same state as the ballpark. But there is something that we alone have unique insight to that should really make us angry. And I'll tell you what it is. It's not the sins of others. It's the sins of us. Our sins is what should make us angry. The damage it causes to our lives and to others' lives. Our apathy, our unholy laziness, our complacency, our pride, our indulgence, our image management, our people-pleasing, our cowardice, our sin is why we really have to be careful then with our anger. Does our anger align with Jesus' holy anger against religion? And if so, are we prepared to be crucified for our display of that anger? I want to go back to that quote one more time by Shane Claiborne. He says, those who follow Jesus attract the same people Jesus attracted and frustrate the same people Jesus frustrated. Jesus attracted the irreligious and angered the religious. Are you doing the same? Are we doing the same here at Refuge? Or has religion crept its way into a church of professed anti-religious types? Are we still attracting outcasts? Are we still offering mercy to the adulterers? Are we still creating space for doubters? Or have we somehow gotten lost in the business of church? Our time, our effort, our brain power, our money, is it being used to feed the orphan and the widow? Or have we inadvertently upheld the very religious system that we thought we lost? I say that because we are in a period of transition as a church, and it's not a big thing, but it kind of is a big thing. Our lease ends on November 1st, the end of October, and so we've got to decide what to do. Do we renew the lease and stay in this place? Do we go find a new space? Do we do something completely different? Everything's on the table, and we're talking about it, and we're discussing it. And I just wanted to real quick, just briefly here in the sermon, introduce our board, our leadership team, because these are your proxies, and we want your input and your feedback. What does the future of Refuge look like? Where are we supposed to go? Where's God telling you we should go? So I just want to introduce our board members. If you guys would just stand up real quick, it's Carly and Dominic in the back of the room. It's Tanya and Jeff right here. It's Mike McGovern right over here. It's Justin. Jane, back with the kids. Oh, he's sick. Justin and Jane, home with six kids. It's Kenny, so not six kids, sick kid. <laughs> it's Kenny and Jessica right here. And it's my wife, Karen, and myself. And then we have a pastoral team, uh, with David and Nicole here, and myself as well. And so we need your input. And we're thinking about this, and we're processing. And we've said from the very beginning there are no rules here at Refuge but the gospel. And so that is the only thing that we have to hold to. Everything else is fair game. We said we were an experimental church, and so we're willing to experiment and play and figure it out and see where God is leading us in this season right now. There you go. That was your BOGO night at Refuge. Two stories within one sermon. Two stories that show who Jesus attracts and who Jesus repels. Two stories that teach us love over personal gain, two stories that call for some self-reflection for all of us in this room and also for this church body corporately. So I'm going to ask the band to come up. We're going to finish with a song tonight. This table-flipping story, that's not the end of it. There's a little conclusion to it here that I just want to read to you. In verse 18, it says, The Jewish leaders demanded, If God gave you authority to do this, show us a sign to prove it. All right, Jesus said, 
destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. What? they exclaimed. It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you can't rebuild it in three days. But when Jesus said this temple, he meant his own body. The temple is where this story took place. The temple is where Jesus showed grace. The temple is where Jesus showed anchor. Jesus is the temple in whom those who are caught are set free. Jesus is the temple that expels the religious but attracts the sinner. And Jesus is the temple that was torn down to the ground, put in a tomb, and three days later was rebuilt to free us from religion. So I just want to stand, man, and I want to celebrate that tonight. Why don't you stand?